Of course, we have a, a deadly hot war raging in Ukraine. And um, this is uh, a war uh, ostensibly between Russia and Ukraine, but it's actually a, a war between Russia and the West being fought by Ukrainians in Ukraine. Uh, so unfortunately, this is a war between superpowers, especially Russia and the United States. It's a kind of contest that went terribly wrong over who would control the politics of Ukraine. And Ukraine itself uh, is a complex uh, uh, society, uh, but uh, the United States uh, already 30 years ago uh, had the idea that it would push not only U.S. influence, but the U.S. military alliance, NATO, towards Ukraine. It made that a formal goal in 2008. Uh, Russia said, no way are we going to have a U.S. military alliance uh, on our border. Stay away. And that's a red line for us. And so we've had a uh, confrontation building now for a long time. I saw it uh, very early on because I was actually an economic advisor to President Gorbachev. I was an economic advisor uh, to President Yeltsin. I was an economic advisor to President Kuchma, who was the first president of independent Ukraine. So I've seen it from both sides. Uh, and um, this confrontation, unfortunately, has been underway. In my uh, view, which is not a very popular one, the U.S simply failed to show any kind of prudence uh, for 30 years. The Russians kept saying, we don't want your military alliance on our border. Do you hear us? No. Do you hear us? No. And this went on and on and on. In 2008, uh, George W. Bush Jr., in his final year of office, pushed NATO to commit to Ukraine's membership in uh, NATO. And uh, Putin was furious and said so to George Bush. In 2014, the United States participated in the overthrow of a pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych. That actually started this war because this war didn't start in February 2022, as is often said in in our media, it started in February 2014, actually, with the overthrow of uh, Yanukovych. After that, the U.S. poured in weaponry. Uh, Russia supported separatists uh, in eastern Ukraine, where ethnic Russian populations uh, are concentrated. And we've been at war in a proxy war for eight years. Uh, at the end of 2021, just to bring us up to date, President Putin uh, tried a final time with Biden saying our red line is NATO enlargement. We need to negotiate. And Biden said, no, we're not negotiating over that. That's Ukraine's right to join NATO. Uh, and um, the war uh, intensified with Russia's invasion on February 24th, 2022. I find all of it utterly tragic and utterly dangerous, tragic for Ukraine, because while the Ukrainian leaders say, yes, we're going to win, they're actually caught in an unwinnable situation. They're trapped in a superpower war. I warned, uh, I'm, I know some of your uh, listeners are, are probably Afghani. I said, you're going to make Ukraine into what happened to Afghanistan. Uh, over decades, uh, again, caught in a proxy war, uh, in a war that was only a tragedy for Afghanistan. Now we see Ukraine being pummeled in this way. And um, I think the U.S. Uh, just has been terribly unwise. I don't like what Putin has done, but this has been a building confrontation. And, and that's that's the sad part of it. And by the way, if you analyze it politically in this way, it also gives you the sense of how to get out of this, because what really needs to happen is Joe Biden needs to pick up the phone and say to Putin, we've heard your red line. NATO is not going to advance to Ukraine. Now you get the heck out of Ukraine. 
And that's the basis of how the deal could be made. Just just on that, because <clears throat> you said in a recent interview as well that we're not using diplomacy. Um, in this current situation, you know, how important is diplomacy? You've, you've talked about how it may be the way to the solution and kind of peace um, in this scenario. But how important is that? And taking into account the fact that we've already engaged in this aspect of war as well. Diplomacy is crucial. It is the art of uh, solving interstate problems peacefully. It is the art of ending conflicts, which don't just come because people are crazy. They arise over political conflicts. The issue in Ukraine has a number of political conflicts. I put the issue of NATO first and foremost. I would put the issue of Crimea, which is a complicated historical issue. Second, I would push the Donbass, Eastern Ukraine, ethnicity issues, third. But in any event, there are political issues. To solve politics by war is very unlikely. For instance, General Milley, who is the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, said last month, Ukraine is not going to win all its military objectives. Oh, don't say that. Uh, you know, that violates the, uh, the, the narrative of, of the politicians. Um, and, of course, this idea of you don't need diplomacy, you just need victory on the battlefield. In, in a world of nuclear weapons, exactly. whoa, what, what exactly. kind of thinking is this? I have to say, by the way, you know, I've often said, I, I think it's right that the two most militaristic countries of the last two centuries are the UK and the United States, because these have been the two big hegemonic powers. Well, one thing I want to ask is about the current uh, economy of the world right now. Um, and But before that, this concept of sanctioning and boycotting, obviously we've had Western nations say, um, let's sanction harshly sanction Russia, boycott Russia. Uh, and it's it's weird because 45% of Europe's gas comes from Russia and it's causing all sorts of problems um, and the average person on the ground is suffering. Uh, so my, my question is in terms, from, in terms of economy um, of the world, is it even possible to block out such big nation states like Russia and just say, okay, we're not going to deal with you? Um, because we're in a global village now. And so, so I just want to know that economic yeah. perspective. When I was an advisor in Russia in uh, either late 1991 or early 1992, I went over to the energy ministry one night at about 10 at night. And I was shocked because all the lights were on, all the workers that were there, and I, I said, what's going on here? And the minister said to me, but Mr. Sachs, we cover 11 time zones. So in Vladivostok, uh, you know, on the Pacific coast, it's already morning. So of course we have to work wow. uh, throughout the, the, the night. Russia's not going to disappear from the map. It's 11 time zones. Uh, it's a, a major global power. Uh, it is a major resource exporter. So a lot of what was said at the beginning that we're going to bring Russia to its knees through these sanctions and so forth, I thought was extraordinarily naive because I've seen sanctions regimes by the U.S. It's a favorite policy instrument. Uh, you know, it's war by a stroke of the pen because it creates a lot of destruction, but it uh, doesn't uh, involve troops on the ground and um, it can cause deaths through the collapse of the healthcare system or other things in countries. And, but the American public doesn't know anything about it, so a president can do it on his own. In any event, very rarely does it have the political outcome that the U.S. Uh, thinks it's going to have. So I said at the beginning, these sanctions would not work, and they would have a boomerang effect. Because like you say, we're going to show how tough we are. We're going to cut ourselves off from our energy supply. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> so now Europe is going into a recession. Uh, Russia is exporting uh, to Asia, to India, certainly on a large scale, to China on a large scale. Uh, and most of the world is not on side with these sanctions. These sanctions are 
the so-called Western world, which is the US, Canada, UK, European Union, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Korea. That's about it. It's about 20% of the world population. 80% is not on side on these sanctions. And so you're not even isolating Russia in this story. Uh, the whole thing has been dreadful, especially, by the way, for Europe and especially within Europe for Germany, because Germany built industry on the basis of low cost natural gas. The United States kept saying, don't do that, don't do that. I said, why not do that? That's what international trade is. Russia exports its gas. Germany exports its industry. That's a mutual, mutual gain. Uh, I just want to bring this home for a second. So <clears throat> what's your opinion on countries like the Ukraine, UK, uh, the European countries you mentioned, US, spending millions, if not billions, in funding war, the war in Russia at the moment, when people at home are starving? Here in the UK, you know, we've got this huge cost of living crisis. Um, lots of people are going to food banks. I'm a doctor and t today is actually a, a nurse's strike in the, in, in the NHS. Uh, next week, we have the paramedics striking as well so there's a huge kind of um cost of living crisis household items have shot up petrol is more expensive yet nations continue to spend money and go to war whereas at home you know we're we're kind of suffering uh, as as a population itself what's your opinion on that well look it, it first of all it's not just billions it's trillions so mm. uh, the world is spending one and a half to two trillion dollars of armaments. By far the biggest spender is the United States. Uh, U.S. Congress is about to pass something like a nine hundred billion dollar uh, defense spending, so-called defense spending. It's pretty offensive in my mind. But in any way, I would say a nine hundred billion dollar military budget. And that doesn't even count the CIA the intelligence agencies, the homeland security. So we're spending well over a trillion dollars just in the United States. And we also have people suffering. And then the politicians say, oh, no, no, there's no money for that. So this is a completely outmoded way of thinking. It's a very dangerous one. Uh, as I say, I think Britain got used to it because it was at war for a long time. There's a famous map of the world that people have seen I think it's the 23 countries that Britain never invaded, uh, something like that, because British, you know, the British military has basically invaded almost everywhere over the course of history. We are not in the Crimean War, although they want to make it the second Crimean War. Maybe I should put it a different way. We shouldn't be in the second Crimean War, and our politicians should know better because the first Crimean War didn't solve any fundamental problems either. So we're wasting our time, we're wasting our money, people are suffering, and there was a way to avoid this war, and today there is a way to end this war through negotiation. And it starts with the self-responsibility of NATO saying, okay, we get it. If Russia leaves, we don't go in. That's the words that need to be said. I, I, th I think it's also important um, to mention here, just... Um just almost ending but you're not you disagree with putin's moves as well like it, people need to realize that as well it's, oh, of, of course, course you, you you're blaming um the nato expansion that makes sense but you also disagree with putin going in and causing this war of course i do and what i said strongly at the end of 2021 and i tried to push it to the white house also is avoid a disaster that's about to happen. Hmm. I have no sympathy for a Russian invasion. It's horrible. But I have no sympathy for the US not taking the steps to avoid it yeah. or to end it. So this yeah. is both sides. The main point when you have this brawl, separate the two brawlers. And that's what can end the fighting and make Ukraine safe again. Thank you. Um, just to end, I want to talk about interest the, under the current capitalistic model, um, because a lot of economists, war experts have said that the reason 
you can have long wars is because you can just nations can borrow money which is of course based on interest they don't have to tax so harshly because they can just borrow the money so therefore your population isn't affected so much um even though that you know the british taxpayer ended um paying off world war one um loans just in 2015 um however obviously interest enables that and the reason i ask this is as muslims a lot of people will know that in the islamic paradigm interest is strictly forbidden it's because of how you can manipulate um, people you can um, control people as well through interest and nations in fact um, because they're in debt to you um, and also interestingly the quran says that interest will lead to war um, as well sure. which is which interesting. is interesting yeah Very and um, yeah. and that this is quite explicit as well and of course we, we we're at that stage where where we're seeing that so i just want to um as an economist take your view on the role of interest in this whole um, global warfare which we've been seeing um for for decades now L let me put it this way if i could uh for uh millennia Wars were fought by princes who sent the average peasant to death. And uh, the princes uh, viewed this uh, partly as their game or their glory, uh, but uh, it was the people who were suffering. Then we thought, or maybe sometimes it was thought, that democracy would stop this. I found it interesting to think that Britain was perhaps the most democratic or nearly the most democratic country in the 19th century already, but also the most war making because there's a difference of domestic and uh, war making. So you could have some democracy and Britain developed uh, some democracy in the 19th century, uh, real democracy. And um, yet it made war everywhere because it was plundering abroad, because it thought empire was grandeur, empire was wealth, and, and so forth. Then we thought, well, now we'll hold our leaders accountable. And that comes to the question, well, if, if you can finance things with debt, or if you're not accountable because you can uh, put on sanctions with the stroke of the pen and no one asks, uh, that breaks down too. So I would ask the basic question, first of all, are the uh, people in Britain or Europe or the United States well informed about the causes of this war? I would say no. That's first point. Second, did this war come from below or from above? Uh, both on, on both sides, uh, whether it's the Western side or the Russian side. This was a war from above, not a war from below. This wasn't the public clamoring for war. This wasn't intrinsic hatred. This was leaders making decisions. Now, the public was ill-informed. The public was told a false narrative. Uh, and uh, maybe the public went along at the beginning. But now, where are we? I don't think the American people like this war. They want negotiations. I bet that in the UK, people want negotiations more and more. I just heard in Germany of a very recent poll showing a big majority of Germans want negotiations, but their government officials do not right now. So I think that there's a complete lack of accountability at the top. And in the U.S. case, a lot of foreign policy is in the hands of a very small group. It's in the hands of the president. It's in the hands of a small group in the executive branch. It's in the hands of a small group in the Congress. <clears throat> and it's in the hands of the so-called military industrial complex, which is a few businesses that make the weaponry. And there is this view of a small elite that this war is good or in US interest or okay or profitable or many ideas but it's not the view of the American people, who, by the way, have not been told the truth about this and don't have even a mechanism 
to hold the government accountable because Biden is about to get another maybe even $40 billion of money to the war without any separate vote on it because he's going to stick it in an end of the year big package that has to be voted in order to keep the government functioning. So they're afraid even of a debate on this issue. I, I guess <clears throat> just to reemphasize the point. So if Biden is getting that 40 billion, how is that amount even possible? Like you say, it's a that that's a, the Treasury will go borrow this money. And mm. and normally it used to be the job of parliament anywhere it was the main job of parliament in the even in how parliament rose which is to say to the sovereign, to the king, you you can't fight that war or raise money without our vote. Yeah. And now we don't have that because, well, the Congress is going to vote, but it's going to vote on it as one line item in thousands. And I spoke to some congressmen about this. I said, now we need a debate because the American people need to know about this and we need to say that negotiation could end this war. He said, no, no, there won't be any debate at all because it's just going to be a piece of a package that's going to be pushed through without a debate. 